Hey, Hammy here, back with part two of section 9.3, uh, where we talk about microevolution and the genetics of populations. Uh, in the last video, we talked about two scientists, Hardy, we Hardy and Weinberg, uh, that came up with uh, where they combined ideas of Mendel and Darwin. They came up with a theorem that said, uh, these things must be true for evolution to not happen for the allele frequencies to stay in equilibrium. So in this video, we wanna look at, okay, so what things will cause changes in allele frequencies and in which things will cause evolution to occur. So just a quick glance at kind of an overview of this, and you can always uh, pause this video and, and look over this at a later time, uh, but we wanna look at four different things, mutations, gene flow, a genetic drift, which includes the founder effect and the bottleneck effect, and natural selection and how natural selection affects uh, phenotypes, especially with a polygenic trait. Okay, the first one, mutations. Okay, we often refer to mutation as the raw material for evolution to occur. Because remember, for things to change, their DNA has to change. In order for their phenotypes to change, their DNA has to change. Okay, the genetic programming language of the cells of the individual. Okay, so when mutations happen, remember mutations are random changes in DNA sequences. Uh, remember, sometimes they can be neutral. You won't notice them. Uh, sometimes they can be negative or bad, and it might cause a thing to not survive, or you might get a mutation that is good or a positive mutation. Uh, an example they use sometimes are the peppered moths. A study was done uh, with peppered moths in different kind of this light and dark phenotypes. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, before the Industrial Revolution, you had more light colored moths, okay, that, and they kind of rest on, on trees and tree bark. But after the Industrial Revolution in Europe, where there was a lot of soot and it made, made kind of everything covered in this black soot, uh, they noticed that the population frequency within the population of the darker colored moth actually increased. Okay? Increased. Uh, there was a mutation that gave them a darker wing color that made them gave them better camouflage. So the frequency of the dark went up and the lighter colored moth frequency okay, went down. Okay? Um, that mutation provided that new sort of benefit uh, to an environment, especially when the environment, ENV, when the environment changes. Okay? Suddenly a mutation which might have been bad now might be positive. Second thing is gene flow. Okay? Gene flow, when things move into, okay, which would be immigration, or out of, which would be emigration, of a population. Okay, this can affect allele frequencies. So over here you have a population of green beetles, and over here a population of tan or brown beetles. Okay, if one of these brown beetles leaves this population and enters this population over here, now you're going to change the allele frequencies. If the green and the brown, the color is controlled by one gene, okay, now you're gonna introduce new alleles to this population. And that's gonna change the frequencies of the green and the other alleles that might be uh, in this population. The third thing is genetic drift. Okay, genetic drift, just like things, uh, if you throw a log into the water or a board or a twig and you watch it drift downstream, okay, it's just random changes. It's not being, you know, uh, if your motor quits on your boat, now you're drifting. You're going where the water kind of pushes you. Okay, so genetic drift is random change in the allele frequencies. Uh, the two examples that you'll hear talked about the most when it comes to evolution and genetic drift are the bottleneck effect, okay, which happened to the, the cheetahs, okay? Cheetahs have a very large population up here. 
uh, with, you can see here, 25 different alleles for a gene. So there's a lot of genetic diversity. Well, in the 18th, 19th century, a lot of the cheetahs were hunted, uh, massacred by hunters because they were eating their uh, farm animals, their goats and sheep and stuff, and also changes in the habitats. Uh, the cheetahs almost went you know, their population declined severely. They're like, oh, the cheetah's going to go extinct. Got to protect the cheetah. And so they were not allowed to hunt. So the population is rebounding back to the numbers that they once were. Okay. But you'll notice that some of these novel alleles had been killed off. So now this new population must repopulate with less alleles and it takes many 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 years for those new mutations to show back up and to build up that genetic variation again uh, so the cheetahs really struggle uh, with very low genetic variation for some traits uh, and this makes uh, recessive traits show up easier in the cheetah populations and it'll take a long time before that diversity you know, builds back up. Another thing we see is the founder effect. Okay, and this hits hope, hope close to home here. Uh, we've seen, you know, a founder is someone who leaves one population and goes, starts a new population. Okay, there's one family that left uh, Europe in the Amish population and settled in the Lancaster area of Pennsylvania. Okay, and then later into our area in Ohio. And they carried with them, okay, a gene that is linked to dwarfism, achondroplasia. And you can see on the hand here, thumb, one, two, three, four, and this fifth little finger out here, okay, and what we call polydactylism. Okay, polydactyl polydactylism is just kind of that, that extra digit. Okay, um, so, and because that initial uh, person, uh, one of those families was carrying this trait, okay, the Amish moved uh, to Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania. Well, the Amish lived in close-knit communities. Who do Amish marry? Other people of the Amish faith. And so we still see that today where there's a very high incidence of polydwarfism or polydactylism and dwarfism within our Amish community. Uh, because the allele percentages are much higher than they are in the general population uh, because of the founder effect. Someone from that original founding population of Amish uh, that came from Europe was carrying that mutation. The fourth one we look at is the effects of natural selection, Okay, where nature is picking certain things to survive over other traits. Okay, so differing fitness. Remember, fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce uh, in an environment among members of a population. An example we see in humans are the sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. You see a normal hemoglobin right here. There's a T-thymine on the DNA, and it's a point mutation. Okay, it's a point mutation. That T was mutated and got mutated and changed into an A and adenine. So that one mutation, if you go through transcription, remember central dogma, here's the mRNA, and then translate it into a protein. Okay, and there's, you know, a bunch of chains and out of a, about 150 amino acids, the one is changed from glutamate in normal hemoglobin, gets changed to valine in sickle cell. And what that causes, if you look over here, in, especially in times of low oxygen concentration, instead of a nice round donut shape that's very flexible to get through the capillaries, they get these sickle cell shapes, like a sickle, like the Grim Reaper uses, or something you'd use to harvest wheat or cut grass, tall grass. And that sickle shape, they tend to kind of clump, you know, clump together, and they'll clump up in your capillaries, and they cause a lot of pain and stuff. And scientists started doing some research, and they noticed that uh, the people that were of middle African descent in the United States had a higher incidence of sickle cell anemia. And if you overlay the two maps, okay, this is the map of people that carry the sickle cell gene allele, 
and this is the map of malaria. And what they found is if you did not have the sickle cell trait, okay, you had a higher case of developing malaria. If you had two sickle cell, two sickle cell alleles, you got sickle cell disease, and often you would die because of complications from sickle cell disease. But if you were a carrier, you had a normal hemoglobin and a sickle cell hemoglobin, uh, you had the sickle cell trait, they noticed people with a sickle cell trait, it helped prevent uh, dying from malaria. Uh, malaria, remember, is a pathogen carried by a mosquito that uh, affects, and it kind of the life cycle involves the blood, the red blood cells. And because the carrier of this trait had a, had a, we call it a heterozygote, heterozygote advantage, okay, it perpetuated that sickle cell mutation in populations around the world like of this middle African descent here where there was a lot of malaria, okay, it kind of perpetuated, it increased the frequency of the sickle cell allele. And so we still see that today in the United States that mostly African, uh, people of African descent are the ones that deal with this sickle trait. Okay, finally, we want to look at three things uh, in which how natural selection can af uh, affect uh, polygenic traits. Now, you remember polygenic traits, uh, if we take everyone in the population and graph it, you get, remember, what's called a bell curve. Okay, bell curve. Uh, that bell curve where most people will be average, like if we do everybody's height, uh, everybody be average, you'd have a few really small, really short people, and a few really tall people. So you get this bell curve. How does natural selection, there's three different ways uh, that we want to look at in biology about how natural selection affects this bell curve. The first one is stabilizing selection. That's where individuals in the center of the curve have the highest fitness, are better able to survive. So if you look at the fur color of the monkeys down here, uh, it's it's going to kind of, if, and then over here shows, it's going to select against the lighter colored fur, and it's going to select against the really darker colored fur. Okay, so what happens to your bell curve? Okay, it's going to push in, you know, the extreme phenotypes are selected against. So your bell curve is going to get really narrow, in the middle, most people be average. On a, another example, a lot of books use is human birth weights. Okay, the weight of the average weight of human babies. Uh, if you look back in history, uh, if a baby was too teeny tiny small, okay, there was often complications and they died. If a baby was too big, there was problems having birth. And that's before we had hospitals and C, -se C sections and all that. Uh, so if it was too big, there was problems, and mom and possibly child might die. So we've seen over the ages that the human birth weight has narrowed to this very narrow range of like, oh, six to eight to ten pounds at the most, uh, where, you know, that's the average size of a human baby. Why? Because the extreme phenotypes were selected against, and it made that bell curve very you know, very narrow in the middle. It's just the average that tend to survive. The second type of selection we see is directional selection. This is better fitness at one end of the curve. So let's say the darker furred monkey uh, what had a better advantage over here, and we selected against the lighter colored monkey. What's going to happen after many, many generations? Okay, the range of phenotypes of the curve will shift towards that one extreme that's favored. Okay, so you have your bell curve. Okay, originally it might have looked like this. Okay, that curve will move to one extreme, or it could move the other way as well. Um, we'll talk uh, later about uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant that 
looked, observed the beak finch size on the Galapagos Islands and how during a drought, the bigger, stronger beaks were an advantage. And so the average beak size increased just in a few years, okay, while they were studying them. Okay, so directional, that bell curve is going to move in one direction or another because of natural selection. The third type is disruptive selection, okay, or sometimes referred to as diversifying selection. This is higher fitness, higher fitness at both extremes, and it's going to select against the middle or the average. Okay, so here's our bell curve again. Okay, there's going to be selection or natural selection pressure against the average, and both extremes are going to have higher fitness. So let's say the lighter colored monkey might find a habitat that it fits, it blends in very well, and the darker colored monkey will have a habitat that fits very well in with. And we're going to select against the average. Well, what happens? You're going to get more and more lighter colored monkeys and more and more darker colored monkeys. Okay, so the curve, okay, that once looked a bell curve that once looked like this, okay, we'll now have one hump here against the average and another hump here. Okay, there's pressure here against the average. And these, as these two things slowly move and become more and more different, okay, we think this one is important because it may have been what led to speciation. These two things can eventually become so different Okay, that they may not recognize each other anymore. And they, we might actually classify them or they might become two separate species. Okay, so I hope this video has helped you. It's a little bit longer again, but I hope it's helped you kind of understand of what kinds of things can cause change. Remember, change is evolution, change over time. So what things in the genetics of a population uh, can cause those genetics to change, those populations to change over time and cause evolution.